My name is Jack Bobo, and I'm the director of the Food Systems Institute at the University of Nottingham. I appreciate all of you being here today. Uh, for those of you who are around for the last session, there's been a lot of conversation about collaboration and innovation. Obviously, this is an innovation conference. And one of the conclusions of the last session was that we really need change. And so I'm going to be a little provocative here because I like to say that people love innovation almost as much as they despise change. And there is no place that people despise change more than in the food they eat. Because food is what brings us together with friends and family. And if you mess with my food, you're messing with my family. And people don't like that. So what we really need to change is how we talk about change. And so I want to go into that a little bit here. And so I, I want to start, though, by talking about how do most people talk about the future of food. And we heard something about those challenges earlier today, that if we look at agriculture and we think about its Im impact, a lot of people talk about our broken food system. And when we think about its impact on the planet, that's easy to imagine. 40% of all the land on Earth that could be devoted to agriculture is being used for agriculture. The amount of cropland is the size of South America. The amount of pasture land is the size of Africa. Nothing bigger than agriculture in terms of land. Talking about water, 70% of all fresh water goes to agriculture. The Colorado River, the fifth largest river in America, no longer flows to the sea. So these are not the challenges of 2050, they're the realities of today. And of course, if we were to talk about greenhouse gas emissions, uh, 10 to 15% of emissions come from agriculture, another 10 to 15% from deforestation, 80% of which is caused by agriculture. That's almost a third of all emissions, almost as much as energy, more than anything else. So clearly there are huge challenges in terms of agriculture. Uh, and of course, we have 800 million people who will go to bed hungry today so we're not even feeding the people that we have. And we're going to be adding another one and a half to two billion people by 2050. So huge, huge challenges related to agriculture. And of course, if those are the problems, what has innovation delivered? I mean, if we have a broken food system and yet we've had 50 years of innovation, is innovation failing us? So that's one of the questions I want to start with is has innovation failed? And I think it's a good question to ask at a conference like this. So stepping back, though, from agriculture, well, what does it look like in other sectors? If we're to look at CO2 emissions here in the UK, it's about five and a half tons per person. That's more than the global average. Uh, it's a lot and it's, it's way too much. So how we think about these issues and how we talk about them is critically important because yes, that's too much, but it doesn't tell us where we are in solving the problem. So if we just talk about the problem and we don't talk about where we've come from, we don't really appreciate where we need to go. Because five and a half tons, well, that's a 150 year low for CO2 emissions. So it's possible to, for something to be bad and need to get better and yet be wildly better than it was in the past. And of course, if you look at the decline recently, it's declining quickly. Because I think most people want to be for something instead of against something. So how do we communicate in a way that brings people together to solve problems? People worry about sustainability, that it's going to undermine our livelihoods. And yet emissions in the UK, 40% uh, lower than they were in 1990, while GDP is 40% higher. We've decoupled sustainability from emissions. We should be enthusiastic and hopeful about this. And yet people worry about the cost to their livelihoods of sustainability. Uh, if we were to talk about things like uh, electric vehicles, if you have an electric vehicle today, you're a millionaire, or at least in 1990 terms, because the battery in a Tesla cost about $12,000. That battery with that storage capacity in 1990 would have cost a million dollars. That's what innovation can deliver, something that is unaffordable for almost everybody to something that's affordable for almost anybody. So how do we get people excited about the role of innovation so that they don't fear it as change, but embrace it? And so I want to come back then to this question about, so what about agriculture? If all of these problems exist, what's going on with agriculture? Well, 10% of all the people on the planet are going to go to bed hungry tonight. Totally unacceptable in this world today. We produce enough calories. That's bad, but... 30 years ago, it would have been 20% of all the people on the planet going to bed hungry. 60 years ago, it would have been 30% of all the people on the planet going to bed hungry. So 
it's important to understand that as bad as things are today, they were worse in the past and they will be better in the future. How do we talk about it in a way that brings people together? Childhood mortality, lowest point in all of human history. How do we discuss where we are in a truthful and honest way and recognize the change that needs to occur, but talk about it in a way that in makes people excited? Now, we also know that production of crops has dramatically increased in the last 50 or 60 years, while the amount of land that we use for agriculture has remained la largely the same. That's, of course, what innovation and changes in management practices have delivered. And so, yes, 80% of deforestation is caused by agriculture, but how, many, how much of the forests that are left only exist because of agriculture? Well, if we there are about a billion hectares of forest on the planet. If we were farming today with 1960s technology, we would need one quarter of all of, we need a billion hectares, sorry, of land to produce that food. So more than a quarter of all the forest on the planet only exist because of improvements of innovation. So you don't see the forests that weren't cut down, you only see the forests that do. And so that doesn't mean the problems of agriculture don't exist, but innovation is delivering. So one of the thoughts that I want to leave you with today is that in many ways, things are not bad and getting worse. They are good and getting better, but not fast enough. The challenge we have is not to throw out the entire system, the challenge we have is how do we get to our 2070 goals by 2050? How do we get to our 2050 goals by 2030? How do we accelerate the pace of innovation in a way that brings people together? Now, while things are better in many ways in terms of agriculture, the real challenge is how we talk about it. Because we can talk about it in a way that further divides and polarizes and makes it impossible to have change or we can talk about it in a way that brings people together. Now, in the next panel, we're gonna talk a little bit about food, and I do wanna sort of lay out the challenges that do exist when it comes to food. Uh, I'm gonna use some US statistics. 42% of our Americans are obese, 75% are overweight or obese. It's about 36% here in the UK. But before 1975, basically not a single country on the planet had an obesity rate above 15%. Today, basically no country on the planet has an obesity rate below 15%. That's how quickly change can happen, not because people were advocating for it, but because our food environment has changed. So things in terms of agriculture are not just bad, but they're wildly bad. 50% of all Americans have a diet-related chronic illness. The cost to the U.S. economy is about $1 trillion U.S. dollars. The cost of the global economy of the food we produce, and mostly related to health, is 10 to $12 trillion. That's 100 billion pounds in the UK alone. So agriculture, there's progress in terms of food moving wildly, wildly in the wrong direction. The next panel will talk a little bit more about this. So again, how do we think about and talk about this differently? So one of the things that I want to do to set up this next session is really the mindset we have. And this was discussed a little bit in the last, section, uh, the last session. How do we change our mindset to think differently about the future? Now, for most people, when they think about the future, they ask two questions. They ask, what do I think will happen and what should I do about it? Right? I, I suspect that many of you, when you're thinking about what to do about the future, you're asking, well, what do I think is going to happen and what should I do? There's a problem with that though. And the problem with it is, and so I'm gonna use, so, so before I go to the video clip, the problem with it is that what we're really doing is we're preparing for a future that we don't want, right? We're, we're preparing for a future we expect. How many people here think the most likely future, the one that you expect is the best possible future that we could hope for? Does anybody think we're aiming for the best possible future? No, okay. All right, we have at least one person in the room who does. I, I appreciate that. All right, so thinking about the future, how do we change our mindset? So now I wanna use an example of Steve Ballmer, and this is the person who was the president of Microsoft, and he's talking the day that the Apple iPhone 
came to market and he was asked about the iPhone. So here it is. Hopefully the audio is working. And I can't hear the... So, so hopefully you guys were able to hear it okay. So here's the person who's the president of the biggest technology company in the world at the time who hasn't a clue what the impact of innovation sitting in the palm of his hand actually means. And that's because the questions he's asking about plans and how a person uses it, he's thinking about how they use it today, not how they're going to be using it five or ten years from now. So that's what I want us to do in terms of our mindset is we need to stop preparing for the future that we expect and we need to start creating the future that we want because if we have a vision of where we want to go well what I need to do next to get to my preferred future is wildly different than what I need to do tomorrow to prepare for that bad future that I'm expecting and so if we can change our mindset, we can do it in a way that actually excites people because it's a hopeful vision of the future. It's a future in which we have sustainable, healthy, ethically produced food that we all want. Now, we may disagree on how we're going to get there, but if we all have a shared vision for the future, we have a much, more, a much better opportunity to get there. And so I want to end, though, by talking about why now matters why this particular moment is so critical. Now, you already know that we're going from eight to nine and a half billion people on the planet by 2050. And that's where most conversations about the future stop. But what happens after 2050? Well, after 2050, population growth slows dramatically because we're not having more children. We have already reached peak child. The number of children born next year will be less than this year and they will be less the year after that, the year after that, and the year after that. We have reached peak child. So the challenge we have is not to produce more and more food forever. It's to get to 2050 without cutting down our forest and without draining our rivers, our lakes, and our aquifers. Because if we do, we are good forever. Everything after 2050 is an opportunity. If we get there, Every day between now and 2050, it gets harder to feed the world. Every day after 2050, it will get easier to feed the world if we haven't screwed things up. So the thought I want to leave you with before I end is that the next 25 years are not just the most important 25 years there have ever been in the 10,000 year history of agriculture. And they are. They're the most important 25 years there will ever be in the history of agriculture. And that's why we got, have to get it right. And that's why <clears throat> the work we're doing on innovation is so critically important. But ultimately, science tells us what we can do. And it's the public that tells us what we should do. And if we do not have the social license to bring these innovations to market, what will happen is we will get to 2050, we will have all the solutions to create a sustainable and nutritious future, and we won't get to use them. So the real challenge is how do we bring people together and how do we change the language we use in order to create that sustainable, nutritious, and equitable future that I know we all want. Thank you very much. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Thank you.